coach. It's more like a chef than a cook. They're not following a recipe that says, if I do eight 400s of this rest and I do this, then of course everybody's going to get better. They're more like a chef who goes, I think that means a little bit more salt or whatever. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who loves Marmite, but not by itself. Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 52 of the Running For Real podcast. Yes, that means Running For Real is a year old. Happy birthday to us at Running For Real. Really excited that it's reached this point, although it does seem like a lot longer, doesn't it? So last week, I actually can tell you, I do not know who my previous guest was. I am recording this in late December. As you know, I have prepared these episodes far in advance, as right now I will be busy looking after a small person who has just joined me in the world. And actually, at this point, this is the only slot for the week before this one that I don't know who this podcast is going to be. So you are going to find out probably around the same time I am. No, actually, that's not true. I will definitely know because I will have to record it. But at this current time, I do not know who last week's episode was, but I'm sure it was a good one. So be sure to go back and check it out. Today, we have one of the most out there, shall we say, uh, but truthful interviews I have ever done. Dave Collins is the former performance director for British Athletics, and his story was very well known in the media a few years ago when he was removed from his role. You will quickly see in this interview that Dave doesn't hold anything back from us. And not only does he share his thoughts about the way elite performance is handled, but he has some incredible advice for the rest of us, making you think about sports psychology in a way you never have before. My mouth was on the ground most of the time with some of the things he was saying. It was pretty, pretty impressive. So I hope you enjoy this one. So are you ready to meet our new sponsor, Run Angel, and hear from Body Health? Do you ever wonder about your safety when you're out running? I never used to until I became pregnant, that was. And now I can't believe I was so naive to think that nothing would ever happen to me. Run Angel gives me the peace of mind, and I know it will give you that confidence too. Tune in later in the episode to hear the Running For Real coupon to get you 10% off at runangel.com. New year, new you. Well, kind of. By now, most of us know that big New Year's resolutions really don't stick most of the time. But small ones that we can actually stick to, they will make a heck of a difference. Just like adding body health perfect amino to your routine made a big difference for me, and it could to you too. Dave, thank you so much for joining me on this Running For Real podcast. I just want to tell everyone listening, um, I usually do a bit of a pause before I actually start the interview, say about 10 seconds. Dave is the first person ever I could just see in the screen who was actually counting me down. I did not wait 10 seconds. I (laughs) did a lot less than that. But uh, (laughs) so if if I'm laughing, that is why I'm laughing. So um, Dave, thank you so much for joining me. It is wonderful to have you here. Definitely someone I have, you know, loved learning from and seeing um, what you've been able to do with people over the years. So thank you so much for joining me. You say the nicest things and thank you. I'm very honored to be here. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> no, this is great. And, and you know, there's a lot of different things that we'll cover today. I know my audience love the psychology ones. These are really the ones more than anything else that going to hit them. They just so- soak everything up and, and really get a lot out of it. So I know that you're going to be just with your, your personality and the way that you, you are, you're going to really kind of give them action, actionable advice that they can use. So I'm looking forward to okay. this and let's so talk no about pressure at all. Really, yeah, Thank no, you. you've got to get it, got to get everything right now. You've got to make every single person listening run the best time they've ever run in their life oh, within, no. okay. within, uh, I'll give you three and a half weeks to, to turn right. everyone around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So well, right. I used to say I'm DC, not JC, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that works. <laughs> okay, so right now you are the um, director of the Institute of Coaching and Performance. Now, for someone who's listening, who's wondering, what does that even mean? Uh, maybe start with telling us about what that involves. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it's it's almost my second job, Tina. Uh, and I'm I'm basically a research professor. 
I run my own research institute. We have uh, a suite of uh, postgraduate research programs aimed at the practitioner. So we have a professional doctorate in elite performance, um, which gives lots of coaches, but, but quite a, a very broad spectrum of people the chance to come in and study. The main idea being that we're doing stuff that's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, we call ourselves pracademics. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's academically rigorous, but we're trying to make a difference. So, uh, you know, it's important for us to get our names in the learned journals, you know, the Beano, Viz and all that sort of stuff. But really what we want to try and do is to, to generate research that can make a difference for the practitioner. Mm -hmm. And what kind of, when you say about, um, you know, the research, what, what makes you decide what to kind of go after and think, you know, actually that's something I think I'd really, I, people would really need to learn more about. What gives you the ideas for that? I think it's a cracking question. Um, we'll have certain themes that we've been doing for quite a while. So we, we continue to do a lot of work in talent development. Um, we do a lot of work on how coaches should coach and can make themselves and help themselves coach better. Uh, that's very much related around the view of coaching as a decision-making game. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got a number of different options. I could I could run this drill or this drill. Should I do five eight hundreds or four three whatever whatever? And therefore, the, the the basic point of being a high level of being a coach at any level actually is in the decisions you make. In other words, because everything is it depends. Uh, it's very much. Which blend should I use? Mm. Now, as a coach, I can watch other coaches work. I can read sessions that elite athletes have done. It is a capital and common mistake to just copy that and use it with my, you know, with my 14, 15 year olds who are then rendered, you know, they, they can't walk because they're trying to do a session that uh, a world class coach has used with his athlete or his or her athletes. So we emphasize that as professional judgment decision making. So looking at how the coach chooses what to do and then how she or he deploys it. Interesting. So you're talking about literally the logistics of, you know, um, breaking, you know, four miles worth of um, hard effort into kind of chunks of manageable distances for people. Is that, that's a lot of what you're talking about there? For sure. But even, even more than that, um, the extent to which, when you know, when would I challenge? When would I push? When would I play the hard cop? Yeah. When would I be supportive? When would I be quieter? When would I play the soft cop? Yeah, good cop, bad cop type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what sorts of demonstrations would I use? When would I use them? How would I design the sessions that I'm going to use? Um, when would I break them up? What sorts of general movement development would I do, as opposed to specific in a, in a uh, do you know the term CGS sports? Uh, no, maybe you explain that. Okay, yeah. so athletics is, it's a centimetres, grams, second sport. Okay. Yeah, everything's very measurable. Yep. It's very objective. I mean, I'm speaking to you from the um, uh, a major uh, free skiing and, and snowboarding competition, and that's scored by eye. You know, so a series mm. of judges make a subjective judgment of what's going on. In CGS sports, it's very different. You, you ran 153.5, and that was it. You won around 153.5. And, and that's an advantage and a disadvantage because people then tend to, to focus very much on the outcome. Everybody knows their personal best, their season's best, yeah, their PR if you're in America. yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that, it becomes uh, quite important to, again, keep the coach focused and the athlete focused on the process. What are you doing to get better? What are you doing to get there? And that's, again, where this PJDM, this professional judgment and decision making, kicks in. So there's a whole range of different things. I think it'll be on my. I think it depends. Will be on my gravestone. <laughs> but I can think of worse epithets. But it's it's about how do you decide what is the best blend of stuff to do with this particular athlete on this particular day? That might change tomorrow. It might. It certainly would change by next year. Make sense? Yeah. So you're even saying, you know, that particular athletes that like you said, you know, obviously it depends on the person and, and everyone has their own personality, but even at the very top level, you could take a training group of, you know, five or six of, you know, some of the best in, in, in Britain or in America or whatever. And each of those would respond differently to kind of the breakdown of workouts, even if it isn't necessarily physically what they can handle, but even emotionally and mentally. I think... We know, as a, a friend and colleague of mine, John Kiley, who who's done a lot of work on periodization 
and mm -hmm. and how periodization and the principles of periodization are actually a little bit of a myth. The idea that you could do this today with five or six different runners and have exactly the same reaction in three weeks. I mean, you know, that's you know, you would you would have to be JC to be able to do that. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty clever. Yeah. So actually, what you're what you're you're recognising is that the the blend of activity that you do, you might do the same session with the group, but you might do it for very different reasons. Mm. And then, of course, as you've mentioned, there's shall we say the softer skills of how I interact with the athlete or how I interact with the athlete supporting network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I'm working with a world class group, clearly each of those athletes is going to have a lot of people working around him or her. Yeah. They're going to have parents agents, maybe their favorite physio or favorite soft tissue uh, treatment, et cetera. And again, I need to cater for all of that. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, you know, one thing that comes to mind with me is what you just said there is you said about being, you know, the way that the athletes are treated differently. And, you know, I've always been one of those people who who needs someone to like be kind to me and you're doing great and all that. And when people um, I've been on teams with in the past have said, no, I need someone aggressive. I need someone to kind of yell at me and, and tell me like, I need to hurry up and all this. And, and if someone did that to me, it would really kind of upset me. But uh, that's so interesting to hear you saying that because you're it, like, I always thought it was a case of, oh, you know, those people would react very well to the comforting feelings as well, but not necessarily the case that, like you said, the, the people around them and the coaches in particular um, have to learn how to treat that athlete and what they will respond best to. So, And, and there's the, the, the two things here that, yeah. that might be useful for your listeners. Um, the, the first is that what I'm saying is that a coach is more like a chef than a cook. Mm. Yeah, They're not following a recipe that says, if I do uh, eight 400s off this rest this today, then I do this, then I do this, then of course everybody's going to get better. Yeah, They're more like a chef who goes, let's taste that. I think that means a little bit more salt or a little bit more yogurt or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a consequence, they're keeping an eye on what's happening, a real finger on the pulse of, of the, the impact of what they're doing with the athlete. And that's then leading them to be able to make these subtle bespoke decisions that, that optimize the impact with every individual. Mm -hmm. Okay. So far. Yeah. Right. So in, in, can I just ask one thing related yeah, yeah. to that? So in in essence, it's actually in some ways more important to have a coach who really understands you and kind of gets your personality, gets kind of what you need than it is to actually have the physical, you know, having one of the the superstar coaches who um, has, you know, all this success. It's actually better for you to find someone who kind of gets you as an individual. You're going to hate this. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should have known that. You know, some, some athletes benefit very much from going to a hard driving no nonsense coach. This is how it is. This is what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Some like the other sort. Um, but whether you like it or not, Tina, doesn't necessarily mean it's best for you. Mm. So what you've got to do is to be very clever and pick out the bits that you need, yeah, and say, right, I need this this package, yeah, of things. And, and then, therefore, I'll choose that coach. But then, of course, if you're really clever and if the coach is really clever, he or she might go, you know what, um, I know Tina likes this sort of thing, but I really think that she needs. we need to push her work rate up. So I will play the bad cop, <laughs> but then I will make sure that the physio or the soft tissue person or the psychologist or her family give her the other support. Mm. So, you know, again, if, if you like another analogy, the good, the good coach is a chef, but the good coach is also a conductor. And she or he sets up the system, the orchestra, if you will, for all these different bits to play together to optimally benefit Tina on that day and whenever. Wow. This is this is just amazing to hear about and, and just something I've never like discussed with anyone before. So cool. I'm I, not sure it happens with everybody. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> but no. It's certainly it's certainly almost the vast majority of the world class guys I've watched are like this. Yeah. Yeah, they they have this real good sense of of optimization of making things bespoke. They recognise this is an individual game mm -hmm. because even if you're on an athletics team, you're not. Mm -hmm. You're you know it's you, yeah. yeah. And therefore the target that means that that Dave did badly, but Tina did well, is not based on how well did Tina, Tina or Dave did or how many medals they got. It's how they did against what we should have expected from. Them. 
Yeah. Wow. I, I might come back to that later when we talk about the success of international teams. Because sure. it's all, for me, it's all down to season's best and personal best. Yep, yep. Well, and actually, speaking of that, so you said, you know, that that we're very, I can't, I can't remember what the, um, the phrase you used was about, you know, uh, outcome driven. Um, yeah. What do you see in, in personality wise difference between, you know, people in athletics, uh, in running, where it is performance based compared to, you know, athletes who are able to kind of do sports where, like you said, it's more kind of um, subjective and you can kind of see the, um, uh, sorry, objective. So you can see the uh, kind of how they're doing. I think it, 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 it's just a feature of the sport you're competing at. Mm. Yeah, it's just you saying, okay, you know, what what is the best? What is going to give me the best outcome? Because of course, most people are in competitive athletics to do as well as they possibly can. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, 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 you know, another sort of uh, example for me is is how you get multi events coaches and athletes who work on a balance. So you'll take. Um, okay, Tony Minicello with uh, with Dame Jessica Ennis Hill, for example. Um, she has to balance out her effort to get the best possible score from seven events, mm-hmm. or deep may see it up from ten events, and that's what they have to do. So they now have to apportion their effort and their concentration as to how can I get the best balance from that. Now, again, uh, I think that applies to, for example, a fifteen hundred meter runner. Yeah. What, how much speed work, how much endurance work, how much running efficiency work, et cetera, et cetera. What's the best balance for me? And then you look at the athlete and you go, here's the athlete with a set of characteristics. She's got strengths there, areas for development here. But how can I make her the best balanced performer to achieve the highest outcome, mm-hmm. if that makes sense? Yeah. So you've got an outcome, and the outcome in athletics is comparatively simple, Yeah. But the process by which you plan to get there is just as complicated as any other sport. Wow, really cool. Great, thank you. And um, I want to go on now because this is actually something I wanted to focus on um, a lot for the interview. um, And you kind of already described it. We just talked about it a little bit there with, um, you know, outcome goals. Runners in particular tend to, like you said, be very, you know, hard on themselves for, hitting a certain outcome or achieving a certain race goal or time what what are some of your thoughts on you know are runners actually in in a lot of situations damaging themselves kind of making themselves less likely to actually get there by being so kind of obsessed with with the numbers i think you've got to contextualize the numbers Mm -hmm. i mean you know if if you did a uh, if you if you have a cross-country championship on saturday yeah and uh, you wake up and it's, I mean, I'm looking out the window in Breckenridge, Colorado, and it's beautiful blue blue sky, bluebird day, as I say in New Zealand, but lots of the white stuff on the floor. Okay. Now, two days ago, it was blowing a hoolie and you couldn't see, you know, two, two, two foot in front of your face. Now, my expectation as to how well I'll do must vary, surely. Yeah? Yeah. So, therefore, um, that sh- weather is just one of the issues that contextualize what's going on. Time of the season, quality of training, quality of preparation. So what I'm always asking athletes to do when they set targets, when they set goals for an event, I'm going, look, you know the situation of this event. You know the preparation you've had. Um, tell me how well you think you'll do. Time, yeah, more than placement, because I can't affect, you know, I mean, I'm a big I'm a big chat, but I wouldn't be able to knock everybody else off at the start. <laughs> uh, although I'd have a, that's the only way I actually do any good. But no, you know, how well are you going to do? Because again, in my experience, one of the characteristics of good athletes is that they have a pretty good and accurate sense of how well they'll do on any particular day, and they'll be able to rationalize that was a good performance, that was a bad performance. So and clearly, when you start talking about different athletes, they, you know, you, even your identical twins might have the same performance on a day, but the context might make it a good performance for one and a poor performance for the other. Mm-hmm. So contextualizing it and knowing what to ex- what you should expect is for me much more important than saying I'm going to win that race because you can't do anything else about you can't do anything about everybody else. You can say I can run that or I can run like this or I will concentrate on what I need to do to be the best I possibly can be. And that to me makes more sense. Yeah, no, I I'm definitely <laughs> always been one of those athletes as well and um I know it has frustrated people over time that I I haven't really been racing 
uh, as much as maybe I should have because I'm just saying, you know what, I'm going to do the best I can be and I'll finish where I finish. <laughs> now, now, let, now, let me again. Oh, sure. Um, I, don't, I mean, no, sorry. I don't want to come over as a, as a lovely, cuddly, fluffy bunny rabbit because, of, <laughs> of course, I'm not. I'm, I'm big and horrible. Um, so what I'm doing is saying that that's for challenge. Yep. That you might say, I think I'm going to do this. And I might go, Tina, you're having a laugh. You know, as we say in England, you're having a Turkish. Yeah, you're having a really? laugh. I've never heard yeah. of that phrase before, having no, a Turkish. A tur- Turkish bath laugh. Okay. I've heard ha- right. having a laugh, but, but not. <laughs> it's rhyme, rhyming slang. It okay. comes from being East End. But, okay. but, but seriously, what you're talking about is that, that, that those, those suggestions are up for grabs. And, and one of the nice things you can do in certain athletics events, just going outside the sort of – I mean, clearly, as soon, as soon as you start getting longer distance in, in the track events, tactics come in and all sorts of other things, yeah? But in, in many of the uh, the field events, for example, uh, you can have sort of almost like check markers. Mm. Uh, I work with a, a jab guy who would throw uh, with a 700 gram on a Tuesday – what he thought he would throw with an 800 gram on a, on a Saturday. And that was one of his markers. You know, that was him focusing on the process to be able to get the outcome that he wanted. Mm-hmm. Now, similarly, I think that runners might sensibly have test sessions, yeah, a key session, six, six threes or whatever, yeah, and that would give them a really good process marker as to how they were doing and show them, okay, at the minute, God, you're in great shape. Yeah, at the minute you're a little bit behind where we'd like to be, but that's okay. You go and do the best you can, because otherwise you're trying to make decisions and predictions. Well, you might as well consult your astrology chart. Mm. Yeah, you've got to have something hard that you and I can talk about. So if the, if Tina as the athlete and Dave as a coach, we need to be able to have a, a fairly full and frank discussion that says, "Come on, Tina, you know you can do better than that. You should do better than that." Or blow me, that's a you know. That challenge of the three months preparation you've just had coming off that injury, nah, wind your neck in love. That's that's a reasonable performance. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. So for people listening who a lot of my listeners are maybe road runners, you know, um, going to be doing marathons or uh, 5K, 10K um, and, you know, not going to be on the track as much or not going to be able to kind of uh, pick and choose things, I guess, quite as much as, as an elite runner would. So for them, um, would a good, you know, have picking out maybe a few, I, I guess you tell me how many um, times per, you know, season during the training segment where they would kind of um, have a essentially a, a performance indicator and take a few specific ones and really kind of use those as, as guides. Is that kind of what you're saying for the majority of people? Yeah, for sure. I think that I think that helps people. It helps everybody. It certainly helps the coach know where she or he is. Mm-hmm. It certainly helps the athlete know where she or she is. And and I'd, I'd recommend it. But I but I'd have different. I might have different markers for different times of the season. You know, if if I'm in training for a half marathon, yeah, or then what I'm going to expect and the context the context goals I'm going to set would be different than if I'm going for a full marathon or even ultra distance. So it's very much looking at where are we. What sort of thing are we targeting? And then working classically, working backwards to plan. Okay, let's see where we are here. Make some decisions then on on, on what's going on. Mm-hmm. No particular number. Some athletes like more reassurance. More nervous ones might like. You know, I really want to know where I am. Okay, yeah. let's monitor yeah. very hard. Other athletes are very good at going. No, I'm confident. I'm confident in the program. I'm confident in you. Perhaps you and I have worked together much longer. So I go, no, no problem. I can do with like three or four way marks and away we go. Yeah. Okay. So then for someone listening who is, you know, one of those nervous people you talked about, I know that a lot of people, and actually I've been surprised being around, um, you know, recreational runners, um, how nervous they get for specific uh, sessions and specific uh, races. Actually, probably a lot more so than than the elite level. Um, yeah, and, if I could just, if yeah. I just, just something on that. Go for it. People think that the pressures on elite level runners are greater, and externally, yes, they are. But internally, I mean, look, I, I am seventeen and a half stone, like two. You know, actually, I'm nowhere near eighteen and a half stone. I'm about, I'm about two sixty, two seventy. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm a big unit. I was specialised at sports where I hit people. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully, didn't get hit too much. When I started doing marathons before they were fashionable. Yeah, I was getting nervous because I wanted to do as well as I could. Yes. Yeah, and the amount of nervousness that I felt because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Yeah, 
was exactly the same, I guess, as the, the, than if I stepped onto a judo mat. So it's a, it's a mistake to think that the, the pressures are greater because it's what it does to you. Mm. So your recreational runners shouldn't feel bad because they feel that pressure. They should go, this is part of it. You know, it's important. To you. It's ego involved. I'm okay. happy with that. Sorry okay. to interrupt. No, I'm so glad you said that as well because, A, A, no one's ever said that to me, but, B, you know, that makes sense. And I'm sure everyone listening is kind of thanking you for for bringing that up the way that you, you did. and and. So related to that, they get very nervous. They put a lot of expectations and taking one of those performance, um, you know, days, you really kind of want to see where you're at. Like very, I have to do this. I have to show I'm in grit shape, you know, almost putting an, you know, a huge amount of pressure on themselves, almost as much as a race to perform because otherwise they'll be seen as a failure. What what can you say to them listening right now if if that that is the kind of case where they quite often don't run as well as they should have because they end up putting too much pressure on. What's the point of the test? The point of the test is to show you where you are. And you are where you are, yeah? If you aren't where you should be, then that's something to worry about. If you're ahead of where you should be, there is rejoicing and dancing in the streets. Um, but if you are where you are, that's great. And, and what you do is, look, this is, this is I, I tend to colour code my sessions. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't coached much athletics. I've coached a lot of other sports. And I tend to colour code my sessions. So I'll have red sessions where we're going, this is a high intensity, I want some performance, yeah? Right down through amber sessions where we're going, you know, we're ticking through. Green sessions, which in some of the sports I coach, are much more technical development. So I don't expect you to get all happed up because you've got to relax to sort of learn the new techniques that you use. On a red session, I want you on point, yeah? On a green session, we can take it a bit more chilled and we can work through. And if you get that idea, that, that for me, an emotional periodization, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. Tina, yeah, which might parallel a physical preparation in the old sort of, uh, the old Matt's behave and, and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. method, for me, again, makes sense. So I know Saturday I've got a hard run and it's a red session, yeah? So I want to do what I can do and that's the way I go. And my preparation for it, is important, but that gives me a chance to practice and refine my preparation for races as well. So all in all, this is a you're doing this because you enjoy it. You're doing this because it's positive for you. If you're not enjoying it, why the flip are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. And what about if someone is thinking, you know, I uh, I'm doing this session. It's kind of you know I, I didn't run as well as I should have, but it was all my all my mental. I know I'm fitter than that. Um, that's quite a common one that I hear is, uh, you know, that my mind let me down. I mentally gave up. See, this is the, 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 the lots of interesting work that says fatigue is a central thing. It's in the head, it's in the brain, it's not mm-hmm. the body. I, I, I'm, I'm ex Royal Marines, uh, where I was convinced that I was very, very shattered, mm-hmm. but a, a, a large PT, PT instructor with a very large boot would, would mentally prepare me and encourage me to, to, to see that I could actually go faster. And by God, I did. I guess that's it, – it's part of the puzzle. It's it's why actually I'm a psychologist and not a physiologist because I'm very into the, the physiology of it and very, very into the science of it. But when push comes to shove, it's the thing between your ears uh, rather than the thing in your chest that's going to determine how well you do. So it, it, it's almost – again, if we were to talk – you remember we talked about that blend, that balance, that recipe, yeah, and a particular tweak. So you might look at someone and say, actually, as an athlete, you're in superb form but you underperform in races, yeah? Mm -hmm. So actually what we need to do is more work on this sort of stuff so that you can achieve what you want to achieve. Or we recognize that you love doing the sport, but you don't particularly enjoy races, in which case I'd probably be going, okay, so relax on races. Yeah, it's all right. It's, it's, It's okay. It's almost giving people the excuse to be what they want to be. But clearly there's a whole lot. And it's several podcasts, I'm afraid, mm-hmm. as to what you can do mentally and psychologically with a with an athlete to help him or her perform. Mm-hmm. Which I know is going to be the next question that people would have been curious okay. about. Well, what can <laughs> I do? But I, yeah. I I knew the answer to that that it it isn't quite that simple. I do have a sports psychologist, you know, myself for my own running, and um, I've talked about her many times. And um, so, in this situation, would you say going to seek out someone is the best, you know, solution here rather than? kind of spending all these hours looking for podcasts on mental training and mental toughness because you're going to get little snippets of things. 
I think it, see, this is this is a fascinating. But do you remember that PJDM we talked about, professional mm-hmm. judgment decision making? One of the challenges for me is that most coaches are like magpies, <laughs> and they pick up nuggets of information, or oh, like that, like that. And 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 it, with the current social media network and people like yourselves doing blog posts and da 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 da, da there's lots of nuggets to pick up. We're actually do, we're just finishing a study now where we've taken a, a very well-known blog and we've given it to first-year, second-year, third-year coaching study students, master's, doctoral level, high-level, level five coaches. Unsurprisingly, they are taking different things from it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah? But also, for us, unsurprisingly, there is a lot more criticality there's a lot more hang on a minute that's not as clear as it as it seems at the top end whereas the bottom end are going this is gospel i now need to go and do this does that make sense yeah yeah right athletes are the same you have to have a structure that you look at yeah and and, and a good a good sports psychologist and god knows there are some nonsense ones out there as well but a good sports psychologist will help you to develop that structure in your own head they'll explain to you why they're saying what they're saying so they won't just say look you know stand on one leg point east and go krishna krishna whatever it is you know they'll say no you've got to know why that works and what that enables is a good sports psychologist will be after making themselves redundant at least on the problem you come in with yeah um it doesn't make good business sense as my missus tells me, but it makes very, very good sense for the client. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm after. Don't look for nuggets. Get a structure and then look for for senses of advice where the explanation, and lots of people don't explain, where the explanation makes good sense to you. Now, that might mean that you consult other runners. It might mean that you read biographies of champion runners. It might mean that you listen to podcasts. But for for goodness sake, try to develop the structure so that the little nuggets that you get, it's more it's more knowledge than content, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. more structured bits than it is little nuggets. And then the next level, you start thinking about stuff and you do you create your own ideas. So you go content, knowledge, and the highest order, wisdom. Okay, great. Runners can have their own wisdom. Mm-hmm. This is great. Because Lord knows they know themselves better than anybody else. So true, so true. And what make what comes to mind, uh, you can correct me if this isn't a good example, but, you know, a lot of people rely on mantras or, you know, one of those pictures they see that you know, says, you know, no pain, no gain, which might motivate you for two minutes. But, like, again, it's like little nuggets that, you know, maybe... You know what I hated? I hated <laughs> second is the first loser. Yes. Who, you know, the guy who wrote that, were they really a competitive athlete? <laughs> you know, I, I, I will ret- I will restrain my language as an East End uh, East East End Lander, uh, but that's nonsense. Mm-hmm. You know, on I mean, I've had the pleasure of working with. Well, I mean, it's, it's over. It's almost seventy medalists now, Olympic and world. Mm-hmm. And I can remember one guy who is a multiple medalist and won Olympics. He got a medal, and he went. That was the best I could possibly have done. That's almost a platinum medal because of everything that went before. And then the next Olympics, he got more or less the same outcome, but he went, no, I should have done better than that. That's where context comes in. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? So, yeah. so you can be, you can be, you know, you can be happy as Larry with a, a fifth on a particular day and really miffed with a second on a particular day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like no pain, no gain either. So <laughs> that's, um, that I didn't use. No, very... because in certain circumstances, it, again, sorry, yeah. it depends. Yeah. Certain circumstances, you need to hurt yourself. Yeah. Certain circumstances, it's exactly what you don't need. Yeah, exactly. But no, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And actually, um, when I was in college, uh, university over here in the US, um, I, I, I got what they call All American uh, eleven times, which I was really proud of each of them. But the one yeah. I was most proud of was fifth, even though once I finished second, because the fifth one came after a big injury that I was even happy to be there. Um, exactly. So, yeah, I definitely understand what you say about context. And I think people definitely can get that. Now, before we go on to kind of the other the other side of um, things that you've done and then also kind of talk about what you do now and how you can help people listening. 
Are there any other mistakes that you see athletes make um, over and over again that you would recommend um, kind of people listening really start to pay attention to and maybe consider doing something about? Okay. There's a thing called Hume's Law. David Hume was a philosopher, a Scottish philosopher, and he said that people shouldn't confuse an is with an ought. Mm. So that that guy is a champion. Mm -hmm. She trains like this, therefore I ought to. So I'm very old, so I can remember when Dave Bedford was doing 200 miles a week. So everybody went, gosh, or, or words that effect, yeah. I should do 200 miles a week as well. Yeah. yeah? I, can, I mean, I've worked in weightlifting a lot. And I can remember when Bulgaria was the world champions in virtually every 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 day. So everybody went, they're doing that. I should do yes. that. And that's the biggest mistake I see. Yeah? It might suit them and it might not suit you. So just because he's a champion or she's top class, don't start thinking that you should just copy that. Yeah? You have to tweak it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay? Second biggest mistake. Um can I just, before you go on to the, right. sorry, yeah. the second yeah. one, I, yeah. just as I have an, a question about that, um, social media with regards to that, I know a lot of people listening struggle with, um, you know, let's say they've done a race at the weekend and then a few days later, someone else um, they follow on social media is doing something hard. You know, look at me, I just nailed this, this session and I just did my race a few days ago. And then that person looking ends up feeling bad. Does the social media make this, this part, uh, exaggerated in your experience completely mm -hmm. okay. please ban it Corporate. ban social no, media no. altogether everything <laughs> no, no 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 but you can't but of course yeah. what it means is that whereas you might get you might get depressed because your little your friends in your running group seem to be doing better than you now you can get really depressed about people worldwide mm -hmm. fantastic you know? and you've got to go no contextualize it yeah. you know rationalize it Yep. Anyway, but okay. no, you're, you're absolutely true. You're absolutely right. Okay. Um, and I mean, the only the only other thing I'd say on that is don't believe reputation, mm -hmm. which is probably related to it. So because X is a fantastic world champion, da 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 da, yeah, and says that you should uh, drink lots of black coffee and not eat much, and and and, no, <laughs> you know, because last time I looked, metabolisms were different, people mm -hmm. were different. You know, I think there's a thing called sex that makes us different. I last time I, I'm pretty old, but I still think there's there are differences there as well. So you're going no, contextualize the, the, you know the, the advice, the it dependsness. Yeah. So when you watch something or when you hear a bit of a, a nugget of information, the why and the why not is for me more important than the what. So if I'm I'm giving I'm I'm giving you an opinion, and one of your listeners sits there and thinks. Oh, yeah, Professor Dave Collins, he must know what he's talking about. Gosh, that way lies danger, as Yoda says. Don't go there. Yeah, always ask why and why not. Mm. Always think, how does this fit to me? Which means you have to be quite self-critical, but also other critical as well. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you so much for clearing that up and, and giving us a different way of thinking about that because um, it's it's such a common thing nowadays and and, and you're so right. So thank you. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, next mistake you were going to say before I rudely interrupted you. No, no, that's, no, that was the second one. It was, it, oh, was, that it, was, was it. Being, okay. it was being too much of a respect of a reputation. Okay. Yeah. I am, I learn all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm very, very happy to learn from the guys who've learned with, with me, mm -hmm. you know, so my, my colleagues are a great source of learning for me and I am absolutely fine to learn things from them. I will all the time be turning around to people. And, and as a as a performance director of athletics, I'd be turning around to people saying, hang on a minute, check my arithmetic on this. This is what I think we're doing. Is that all right? Is that are you with that? Because there's only one person who knows everything in the world and I'm married to her. <laughs> I bet she'll love to hear that. Or do you say that often? Well, she, she's fed up hearing it, but she, <laughs> she, she knows she knows it's true and so do I. <laughs> that's funny I love it okay um one more thing I wanted to ask you about was um you know you you did you have worked extensively you mentioned about all the Olympians you've worked with but you have worked extensively with um Great Britain Athletics I think that's probably what they were called at the time it's British Athletics now but I don't know if it was I think they were UK Athletics, UK at the athletics time, at the but, uh, yeah okay. it's probably some sort probably some sort of tax dodge <laughs> yeah who knows i'm i'm not uh not uncertain my opinion on that part because i uh definitely uh don't know what to say and, but... I, and neither will i no you haven't you haven't said anything um but you work worked as the performance director 
Um, one thing that I, I love to see about that was that you didn't even apply for that job. You know, they, they came after you very, very impressed with kind of what you've done. And, and that's, you know, must have been a great feeling for you. Um, but the biggest thing you were kind of set with this really tough ch- challenge of kind of turning the medal count around for the British team. Um, and, uh, you know, were there some things that you noticed about the British team and maybe the way that things were run when you were given that job um, to uh, you, that you thought needed changing or some things that kind of were, in your opinion, the reason that British athletics was struggling so much? <sighs> That's a, I'm, I'm not even going to try and comprehensively address that because I'll put that in my memoirs, which I won't. Because I write. ramble too uh, much. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> God forbid. No, no, no. It, no look, it, it's too, if it was simple, yeah. Yeah. seriously, teacher, if it was just a case of bish, bash, bosh, mm-hmm. then, you know, it, any fool could have done it. Mm-hmm. But, but it's not. It's complicated. I mean, as it, as it goes, I was, I was reasonably satisfied. No, I was quite satisfied with Beijing. Yeah, four medals, but fourth in the medal table. Uh, sorry, fourth in the team table, mm-hmm. which for me says we're getting more people. We had more. Okay, clearly you want your athletes to be as good as possible, mm-hmm. but then when it comes to the major events, you want them to do as close as possible to what they're capable of. Yep. So there were more things. I mean, people used to talk about the the, um, the Seoul Olympics as a really good performance. I think there were something like thirty four percent season's best personal bests. Yeah. It was almost 50 in Beijing, Mm. almost 50%. We got it. We got it as right as we could with what we had. And tough conditions as well. (laughs) But we were upwardly mobile. Yeah. Because when I came in, we went to Helsinki and we didn't do very well. Um, In the same year I took over, we would, we, we would, we were dropped out of the uh, European team championships. Yeah. In the year that I left, we won it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm quite confident that we were making progress and we were on the way up. But that's my uh, party political broadcast at an end. Just, just okay, a few things that I felt were wrong. I felt the sport was too forgiving. Mm. Over, I think there were 247 athletes funded as world class. I remember it because it's the old British Radio 1 frequency. We didn't have 247 world class athletes. I'd suggest we never had 247 world class athletes. What happened was... That where I, you know the athletes, sport athletics, I think, took the money and supported lots and lots of athletes. Yeah, and I'm all for people getting the best support they can be. But if you're going to be measured by your medal count, mm. then some hard decisions need to be taken. Yep. And the people I work with and I took those hard decisions. Um, I think the second part of that, honestly, is that having taken those decisions, as far as we could, we looked at the athlete and the coach in the eye and said. This is what it's like. Yeah. Um, I can remember sitting down with a, a coach and athlete pair at that time and saying, look, I'm, I'm really concerned with how he, how he, he's doing. And the coach going, well, you don't understand athletics. And, and you know, me going, well, you're right, because for the last three years, he's got slower. And I thought the idea was to go faster. I clearly you know, misunderstood something here. You've got a year. Turn it around. Yeah. Or I'm sorry. We'll have to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. It's that honesty. It's that, you know, it's was it stab in the belly, not in the back. I'd much rather look someone in the eye and go, look, this is this is my perception. Now, the third bit of that is that I would say things to coaches, and some coaches would go, yeah, in some of the things I said, they go, gosh, yeah, that makes sense. Some of the things they use the stronger expletive and said, no, it doesn't. But in lots of those cases, they'd come to me and say, look, babe, I think you've got it wrong. Come and look. Let me show you. And I went, in some cases, gosh, you're right. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not a problem. You know, I have no I have no problem making mistakes. Yeah? Indeed, I, I would say to my staff, if we aren't making mistakes, then we're not pushing the envelope fast enough. Yeah? So I think there are a number of things where, the, the need, you know, for me it was a level of honesty and openness between everybody. Now, that didn't work in all cases. I know I can think of two or three athletes here where actually the lines of communication broke down. Because I asked, I said to one of the people working with me, have you said this to this person? Yes, I have. Mm-hmm. And it was a lie. And I, I actually met the guy last year, I think, and apologized and said, look, I understand you were miffed. You were absolutely right to be miffed. That was our mistake. So I think the biggest thing for me is a level of honesty and open criticality that helps people through. I want to see everybody do as well as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when push comes to shove, 
it's a meritocracy. So, you know, a five-star athlete, an athlete who is world-class, will get more treatment and more support, yeah, if they need it, than someone who's just just on the system, Mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. When I got there, 80% of my support budget was being spent on the bottom 20% of performance athletes, which was a bit technical term here, ask about face. <laughs> I, I, I think those are, those are the messages that I, I felt mm-hmm. were useful. Mm-hmm. And I have, it is my absolute pleasure to still get phone calls from people I work with then who are seeking advice or, or talking about things. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. And I wish I was still in the job and I'm not. So Yabu Sabs. <laughs> well, thank you for, for being so honest with us about that. And and I think it's funny coming, uh, hearing you saying that a lot of that, um, as I mentioned to you before we started recording, I'm very honest and open with, with people. And obviously you are too. Um, but it's very un-British to be kind of like straight to the point and kind of, um, this is how it is. People like to kind of, um, you know. See, I'm not sure. I'm, honestly, I'm not sure that's true. Really? I'm, no, I'm, I'm not sure that being open and honest and supportive. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to diss people. I'm not going to mm-hmm. disrespect them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not, but I want to help them. Mm-hmm. But again, decisions have to be taken. Yes. And and it's it's much much better to be open and honest than it is to. I mean, I, I work now as a psychologist with uh, Chelsea Football Academy. Mm-hmm. And as you can guess, there's a lots and lots of boys there mm-hmm. who have dreams as to what they're going to end up playing yep. i'd much rather be open and honest with them i'm not and the coaches god bless them are very you know straightforward in in almost all the cases saying to the guys look mate if you're going to make this you're going to have to do this 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 yeah and it's all the other noises off that sometimes distract the, the young player in this case from getting the top so i i met several uh, athletes who were the next insert name of iconic athlete here, next Radcliffe, the next this, the next other. And, you know, you had to be saying to them, not sure. Were there were a lot of the people that you kind of did get that feeling from? Like that is the next kind of person? Have, has that kind of played out how you expected? Yeah. It has? That's good. Yeah. Is there anyone up no, and coming? It's, it's not good for them. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> because, because it's, you know, because lots of them didn't. But it's being able to have those conversations that say, mm-hmm. look, you know, you're, this is great at the minute, but I'm a bit worried. I mean, it's an interesting it's an interesting fact that people who medal at World Juniors are less likely. They rarely go on to senior success. Yeah. People who are top eight at World Juniors do. Mm-hmm. Yeah? yeah. Now, again, if, if you're coming into the sport, I mean, yeah, I, I had coached athletics at a very, very low level. I competed in athletics at an even lower level. But I am a psychologist, and, and my business is, dealing, is is working with people. Mm-hmm. So when looking at this situation, I want to say to them, look, you know, whoa, hold back, hold back. You know, don't be premature, if you will. Yeah, you're great at the minute, but we want you to be great up there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember having someone phone me up and say, um, my son is the under fourteen world champion at this event. What are you going to do for him? I say, well, I'll probably go away and do more sport and then come back when he's about 17 or 18 was the answer. But it wasn't the answer he wanted. Yeah. I I actually get that quite a lot. People come up to me and say, you know, this 11 year old girl has run six something in the mile. Um, She's imagine what she's going to be doing by the time she's eight, uh, by the time she's 18. And I said, well, she's probably not going to be running if, if, if she, (laughs) and and it does happen all the time. Imagine what she could be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my time machine's a little knackered. I don't know about yours, and my crystal mm-hmm. ball is certainly not given me good service. Yeah, but but there are a set of principles that we can apply. There are a set of characteristics that you can look at in athletes, and they're far from physical. They're yeah. much more mental, unsurprisingly, that will show you that someone has the capacity to get to the top. And if not the top in this sport, to jump into another sport and get the top in that. So what advice would you give just to finish up here with, for someone listening who maybe has, um, you know, a child or someone up and coming who is doing well right now, but they don't want to fall into that trap of pushing them too hard, burning them out, and then, you know, ending up them either quitting the sport or just kind of getting worse and worse and worse until they absolutely hate it. Uh, what advice would you give? We have written a book, he said, with tongue in cheek. Uh, called Talent Development a Practitioner Guide. Okay, I will which, put links in the show notes. Which is basic, which is pretty much from um, not quite cradle to podium, but it's it's that's the idea. Uh, but in general, 
this open criticality, this this thinking. I mean, as a as one example, Tina. So you're looking where to put your child who, ha- who really is enjoying a sport and you're looking where to put them. And mo- almost all parents want to do the best they possibly can for their kid. And they look, they have, therefore they look around for the coach who's doing the best with his athletes. Mm-hmm. Or his athletes. And that's not necessarily the best place for them at all. Yeah? So don't look for the, the winningest and championingest coach with the 13 and 14-year-olds. Yeah, rather go along and look at the circumstance, have a look at it, see if you like it, mm-hmm. see if your child likes it, and then make some decisions about what goes on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's because winning at 13, 14 is absolutely no guarantee whatsoever of senior success. Now, the only other thing I'd say is I completely understand why parents do that because Hume's law applies. He is doing that, therefore I ought to do that as well. Yeah. So it's, it's just being aware and being careful. And to be frank, doing lots of different sports up till about 15, 16, 17 maybe in boys is no bad thing at all. Yes. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Definitely. And I've had a lot of guests on the podcast who have backed that up, you know, having done all the research on that kind of thing and, and said the same thing. The multi-sport athletes are the ones that are still there you know, years later. So uh, definitely good to hear you say that. Okay. Well, Dave, thank you so much. This has been so insightful. Um, You know, you do have your company, Grey Matters Perform. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. If anyone is interested in kind of seeking you out for that, you know, um, honest uh, kind of critical approach that they actually need to get to where they want to go. um, How can people find out more about you? We are just redoing the website. Um, It will come out as www.greymattersuk.com. Um, and that should be available from January, yeah. And uh, there's myself and, and five or six other uh, associates who work together, and we would love to, you know, we love to help people. So okay. away you go. Okay, that's the best way to find you for everyone. Not social media. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, well, we're on, so- You're on social media. I'm told I've got to be on social I'm on social media. <laughs> My daughter introduced me to Twitter. And I get Twitter rage because I read some of the nonsense on there and I go off on one. So, uh, but she's very tolerant. Well, at least it's got a limit of characters, so you can't get you can't go on for for too long with those uh, responses. If, if you do actually respond, or you just mean you you rent uh, yeah. out loud right. in person. Okay, Gina, well, thank you so much. Yeah, for thank time. you, Dave. This has been so insightful. Thank you. Don't you wish we could go back to the days where running safety wasn't even an issue, where we could be out there carefree on our runs, just making the most of being out there in nature? No technology telling us how much slower we are than yesterday, and absolutely no fear in our minds that we might be unsafe. Unfortunately, those days are gone, and we know it. I never really paid much attention to safety products in the past, always thinking that I was invincible and I would just run away. I was a runner, right? Doesn't that mean I could outrun someone? Well, not only was that naive and stupid of me to think that way, but I'm very thankful that nothing ever did happen to me in any safety way. But now I don't run alone without my Run Angel. Run Angel is a wearable that looks much like a watch, but only has one function. One big, giant button in the middle. A button that if you push it, sends off an alarm as loud as a rock concert to alert others of your whereabouts, and simultaneously sends an alert to your emergency contacts with your exact location, letting them know something is wrong. The peace of mind Run Angel gives you is wonderful. And if you ever have to run on your own, it's about time you got one too. Use coupon code running for real, that's the number for running for real, for 10% off at runangel.com. Earlier on in the show, I mentioned that Body Health Perfect Amino made a big difference to me, and it really did, especially at this time of year when marathon training starts and things begin to get really tough. This is always a time we feel a bit overwhelmed as the accumulation of miles starts to catch up, especially when combined with those hard, heavy training runs. I found that taking Body Health Perfect Amino made my body recover from training that much quicker meaning I could really attack those long runs and hard sessions. But it's not just for marathoners, it can be runners of any distance. If you get sore or fatigued during training, Body Health Perfect Amino will help you recover too. And here's why. Your body absorbs 99% of the amino acids in in Body Health Perfect Amino, compared with only 48% in eggs and 32% in meat or fish. I would take them immediately after a run, and as they absorb within 25 minutes, that would give me a nice amount of time to stretch, you know, another component of staying healthy. Then you can enjoy your post-race meal. Get 10% off at bodyhealth.com using coupon code TINA10.
What a fascinating interview that was. Dave was so real, so raw with us. It was such a refreshing interview with an honesty you very rarely hear of, especially at that level of kind of professional. So I want to say thank you to Dave for sharing with us, and I hope you enjoyed that one too. You can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 52, our birthday episode. Well, kind of. Next week, I am going to be giving you an update on how my life is going since our little girl joined us in the world. So stay tuned and be ready for some extra running for real. Well, maybe without so much of the running, but more of the real. I hope you enjoy that one. If you do not want to listen to an update on how things are going, completely understand if you want to skip that one. The following week, we will have an episode with Alex Hutchinson about his new book, Endure. I hope you have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.